Uh, as the PowerPoint said, we are going to be recording this um, for posterity and security sake. Um, all right, so welcome everybody. Uh, let's get started. Um, welcome to the Chafee College One Book, One College Committee Essay and Art Contest and Awards Ceremony. My name is Danny Keener and I am one of your hosts for this evening. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce you to our um, other hosts for this evening's festivities. Uh, first up is co-chair of the One Book, One College Committee, Professor of English, Bonnie Kopp Ostuma. Bonnie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs> the next host up is uh, my favorite symptoms of being human game show host and yours, uh, Professor of English, Deckard Hodge. Also introducing an award uh, winner tonight, my favorite Canadian professor, uh, Ian Jones. Oh, I'm your. <laughs> okay. Are there other Canadians? Yeah, I'm I don't think tell so. John also about yeah. He's he's okay. not really Canadian, so. <laughs> so okay. A couple years in the greatest country, so mm -hmm. anyway, Neil is closer. Another host for this evening is the incomparable La Professora de Español. Mercedes Limon. Hello, everyone. Hola. Como están? And last but certainly not least, uh, my favorite symptoms of being human, book club event host and yours, Laura Picklesheimer. Hi, everyone. Welcome and congratulations to our readers. All right. Uh, before we begin with tonight's proceedings, I would like to talk a bit about this year's college book, Symptoms of Being Human. Uh, this book follows the life of Riley Kavanaugh, a gender fluid teen who does not fit into the typical category of boy or girl. Uh, Riley sometimes feels more feminine and sometimes more masculine and any varying degree on the spectrum between male and female. The story details hardships Riley faces in their life, the friendships they make along the way and the bitter betrayal of those they thought they could trust. Through all the pain, Riley simply hopes that the hurt means something. The presenters we will hear from tonight have written essays or created artwork around the central themes of this novel. Uh, Laura, Pick Laura Picklesheimer will introduce our first presenter of the night. So please take it away, Laura. Hi, everyone. I have the honor of introducing our first writer, Virginia Odo. Virginia's essay, Upside Down, immediately had a deep emotional impact on me and the other judges. Her story is one of motherhood, of love, and ultimately of loss. Virginia's writing is descriptive, powerful, and at times heartbreaking, but full of strength, compassion, and love. In this essay, she courageously writes about one of the most difficult periods of her life. Virginia's story speaks to the importance of cherishing our time spent with family, the finite nature of life, and the way that those we lose continue to live on in our memories. These themes are all the more resonant this past year. I would like to now present Virginia Odo. Hello, I'm here. Sorry, I don't have my camera on because I get a little emotional when I write about her. Okay, so I'm just gonna read it. I'm gonna try not to cry. Upside down. My daughter was a beautiful young girl who was six years old when we heard the words that changed our lives forever. Your daughter has DIPG cancer. Dr. Kiroff says to me as I sit in a dark room filled with only lights from computer monitors with pictures of MRI images on them. My whole world was turned upside down at that moment just like the moment in Symptoms of Being Human when she found out that the girl's dad beat her when she went home. Here was this perfect little girl who survived the odds after a horrible accident that I was in while I was pregnant, only later to be saddled with such a horrible disease. Little did I know that 27 months later, my daughter would or Oh, 
sorry. That when I kissed her on the night of March 16, 2009, it would be the last time I would kiss her little face. My world was destroyed. Cheyenne was six years old when the doctors discovered that she had a terminal brain tumor called DIPG. It had a life expectancy of 10 to 12 months. Who knew that this sweet little girl was in for the fight of her life? Walking back from the MRI, I clutched her lifeless little hand as she had been sedated for her procedure. She seemed so small and fragile, even though I knew she was not. We were maybe 20 feet from the door of the OICU when the doctors came to me and asked if we could speak. Luckily, my dad was there with me, was there to go with me and my mom stayed with Cheyenne. I was pulled into a small dark room. The lights were almost completely off. The only illumination was from the three computer screens that held pictures of my daughter's scans. I took a seat, almost trembling, already trembling and afraid. I did not know where to look in the room or even if I could breathe. My chest was so tight that it was a struggle. I worried about my breathing because it, I was five months pregnant with my youngest child. He started to talk to me and explain what the images were on the screen, but my brain could not comprehend the words that were coming out of his mouth. When he finally finished talking, there was a very long silence in the room. My head was swirling with information that I could not make sense of. I finally looked up at him and asked him if he could please repeat it and maybe dumb it down for me because I was truly not grasping what he was telling me. He smiled a small knowing grin and started to repeat it again, but this time I was getting all the information. As he told me all about this type of cancer and what she would experience and go through, I wanted to throw, throw up and punch him in the face all at the same time. I'd heard stories of children who get cancer and the doctors tell them there's hope and ways to save them. With this diagnosis, we were not given any hope. He said, enjoy the time you have because it's very limited. How did this beautiful little girl get this disease? What did she do wrong? What did I do wrong? When I was finally able to get up, he walked me back down the hall to the room where my father was waiting. He glanced up at me as I entered, my eyes swollen and red from the tears. It was the first time in my whole life that I ever saw my dad cry. We sat together in that room for what felt like an eternity. I did not want to cry in front of my sweet girl, so I had to get it all out now. I now, as her mother, had to make a choice. Do I tell her that she's going to die? She's only six years old, but she is so much smarter than children her age. I knew that if any one of the seven kids could handle this with grace and strength, it would be her. I had to tell her brothers and sisters before she knew and give them each a chance to get out their fears and anxiety so that her life from this day forward would be nothing, would be about making every day count. As we solemnly made our way back to her bedside, the others could see the fear in my eyes. I pulled each of the kids out one at a time along with my mother and explained it all and let them have the time they needed to process. I also informed each of them that Cheyenne bubble was a no crying zone. We wanted her to fight as long as she had and keep her as happy as much as possible. When Cheyenne finally started to wake up from the medication, we were all there just hanging out. She looked at me and smiled, the most beautiful smile I, ever, I had ever seen. It was like the sun shining from her soul through the little girl. She held my hand. It did not take her long to want to sit up and play with her siblings. Watching them laugh and play like the world was not cruel was good for my heart. My husband, now ex-husband, finally made it to the hospital and it was not a loving and it was not the loving and supportive man I had married. This man came in like a hurricane screaming at me. He was quickly removed by security. I followed them outside along with his ex-wife and my father. 
He screamed in my face that I had given her cancer to get back at him for the way he was. I was absolutely floored at these words were even a thought in his mind. Our marriage ended that day. I went back in with my child. My mom and his ex-wife took all the kids home and my dad stayed with me. Once everyone was gone, it was time to let my baby girl know what the doctor said said and where we go from here. They brought in a sweet young lady from the child life department to help us explain it to Cheyenne. Her name was Christy and she looked just like Cheyenne's kindergarten teacher. Her and I had a, a conversation in the hallway about what she could and could not tell my daughter. The only thing I stressed is that she was not allowed to tell her that she was going to die. When she questioned me on that, I responded with a question back. Are you going to come to my house every day and make her get up for chemo radiation and make her take 14 different prescriptions and listen to her cry? That if she's going to die anyways, why should she have to do all this? She shook her head and told me she understands and in we went. Cheyenne did very well when it came to understanding what was going on. She asked a lot of questions about what was going to happen and she did not even cry when they said the word cancer. She truly only cried when they told her that she would lose her hair. She is and was the strongest child I've ever known. I miss her terribly with each passing day. In conclusion, if I had known March of 2009, was going to be the last times with her, I would have made them even more magical. Losing a child is not something I would wish on my worst enemy. It breaks your heart and crushes your soul. You learn to live in a new world where eventually you function around it, but it never leaves you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, Virginia. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> betrayal, abandonment, and heartache <clears throat> are at the center of this next essay. Uh, <clears throat> however, the writer also depicts instances of kindness and care, even if it's in a cold, hard world. It is about finding deep and meaningful human connections with others, as well as the author's journey to find her independence and win her own battles through the struggles that make her stronger. Please welcome Anna Cruz to read her story. Can I share my screen? Oh, I can move from my My name is Ana Cruz, and this is my essay number one for my class, English 1A. I was trying to fight, no cry. Your life is not so unfortunate as to stop fighting. That was one of Angela advice gave me a drug addict. 13 years old, who lived on the coal street of Bogota City. At the beginning of the year 2000, some thieves robbed my brother's house and took all the jewelry they called fine. My brother's, my brother's wife unjustly accused me of complicity in the robbery. And she said I had to pay her for the jewelry. So, I had a strong argument with her and my brother ended up beating me. At the moment, I felt like Riley and symptoms of being human when she was abused in the parking lot. At the 17 years old, I could not imagine that people close to me could hurt me so much and that I would not defend myself. So I left home and for two months, I live in bad condition in the house of some acquaintance until one day I went to live with my best friend, Myra, in a room in a boarding house with no money to eat, pay rent, and pay for college. 
The owner of a bodega offered me a job as a sales woman of the payroll because I was a minor. After three months of hard work, he had not paid me. So he promised that on December 24, will pay everyone he owed. But the long away day came and he did not keep his promise. Abandoned in sadness, I decided to spend Christmas in the neighborhood where lived Diana, my co-worker. From going hungry and embarrassed, uh, and embarrassed because my employer would pay me my salary. To visiting one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Bogota and meeting valuable people there. I realized that the battle to find my ability to stand on my own two feet was exhausting and scared, but it was something I will benefit from for the rest of my life. That December 24 of 2000, I woke up early. My friend Mayra had gone to Venezuela to spend New Year's Eve with her family. The house where we lived had been a clinic in the 70s. Had three floor and shared kitchen and many rooms with wooden floor that squeaked when we walk because I how old it was. It smelled like freshly brewed coffee. So I went to the kitchen to check the cupboard, although I know it was empty. When the owner of the boarding house showed me, uh, saw me, he, she offered me to sit close to her. Mija, this, co this coffee is getting cold, Mrs. Amparo said. Thank you, Amparito, I answered her. We sat together in silence for a moment. Anna, when are you going to pay me the rent? She asked me to return. I did today, Amparito. If in my job they pay me today, I promise I will pay you everything we owe you. Answer her with so much embarrassment. I finished talking to her and left as soon as I called for work. I arrived, I arrived much earlier than the manager and the other employees. I worked all day in the big warehouse with lights that exhibited so many wet smelling and store clothes. I had to iron some heavy leather train coats that was worth for them to finally tell us that the owner was not going to pay us that day. Disappointed, and I get my things, went out to the street and sat on a, a court to watch the people who buy vain food and clothes in the old store with red brick and painted with varnish. So Mary made contrast with my distress. I felt my dream of study in the capital fading away. And as I remember not being alone to enter classes and leaning behind the classroom door to listen to the teacher explanation, my ass flowed with tears, with sun rolled down my cheeks like a river. I don't know it was crying. I, I was crying out of anger, hopeless, hopelessness, hunger, loneliness, tiredness, or all at the same time. Diana, a humble 15 years old girl who was cleaning in the warehouse approached me, uh, she hugged me and told me, Anna, they don't worry, Mr. Ariel will pay us by hook or by crook. He had no idea what she was saying me, but I thank her very much and had her as hard as I could. She continued talking to me and asked me to accompany her home because she didn't want me to stay alone on Christmas night. So we go up from the platform, took a bus and headed to her house. As the bus climbed the mountain, I looked out the window and realized that we were in a dangerous neighborhood in the city. 
my tears stopped falling and pain turned into fear. And I asked Diana if she was sure we were going to enter that place. And she answered, Anna, I was born in this neighborhood. He is the one that controls the security. And everyone here knows me. We got off at a corner. And before we went to Diana's house, we were greeted by a girl who was no more than 13 years old. And it was Angela. And her shirt was stained with blood. I got scared because I thought something was wrong with her. But she told Diana that she ran away from the Javanil uh, Center, that she did it to get to go settle a, a score of infidelity. Then she began her story of how she had stopped three times the girl who lived with her ex-boyfriend. And she asked that was in the neighborhood because she wanted to see her, her grandmother before Christmas. And she told Diana that the meeting they have every year to celebrate Christmas among friends in the neighborhood will be at midnight. Finally, say goodbye to both of them and ran away. I was shocked and cold move. And Diana told me, Anna, she is not a bad person. Only her mother mistreated her. So we continue walking to the almost ruined house where Diana lived. And after Christmas dinner, we went to the midnight meeting. Diana and I, walk through the neighborhood square until we reach a dark alley uh, where 15 young people were waiting for us who held this Christmas gathering every year to drink, smoke, and tell stories around the, around the bonfire. They told us so many terrifying stories about mistreatment men and a miserable life is given give to them on the street and even by their parents. Many of them sold drugs, others were thieves, others were girls who were involved in the prostitution. But they were used to hearing those stories and they were intrigued to know who I was. Diana proudly introduced me uh, as her friend who was studying at the university. I can say that I did not feel pride. On the contrary, I felt fear of being rejected and shame for being so arrogant that despite having had more opportunities than them, uh, I was unhappy. I told them my story and they encouraged me to continue fighting for my dream of being a professional. In the end, Angela, the girl with blood in her shirt, came up to me and, uh, and said, Anna, study. Because your life is not so unfortunate to stop fighting. And you have no live even a tear of what we have lived. Look at me. I have no hope. And I look in her uh, eyes, the look of the sadness. I said goodbye to everyone and went with Diana to her house. But I remember Angela's word in my memory. In the end, I understood that Diana and her friends live as they have been forced to live. And that I did not need to repeat the same history. I will learn that we all must go through a process before we get to the place where we want to be. That I shall not believe in failure. And that the key to achieve it is to live positive, working hard, full of hope and trust in God. Soon after I got a new job and recovered my money, I was all. Um, over the year, the university gave me a scholarship 
and I finished my technical career. After a few months, I received another scholarship and finished a professional career. Five years later, I have my son, David. I reckon, I reckon, um, say, I reckon say with my parents, my brothers, my brother's wife. In 2012, I formed a painting company with my husband. Now, I'm studying a third career and learn a new language. But the most valuable thing I learned is the battle are won by fighting, and you see the difficulties to make strong. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to introduce the work of one of our award recipients tonight, Chris Tashen. Chris submitted a song and a video about relationships. And like he himself said, sometimes they're toxic and sometimes they're healthy. Much like the ones presented to us in Symptoms of Being Human. What I particularly enjoy and love about Chris's um, submission is the flow of his bars and the killer video production. And of course, the lyrics which testify that Chris is a true poet in the making. And now I give you Chris' magnificent performance and joy. Thank you. Okay, Chris, take it away. Hi. Uh I thank you. That was that made me feel great. Um, am I showing the video right now? Cause uh, is that what I'm supposed to do? Gosh, I thought we had it. That's why. Yeah, can you share it or do you want me? I, to I, is it pause? Is that possible? Because I can't share my screen. I could show it. I could put it on, but I can't share my screen. I didn't. Okay. Can, I'll do it. Um, no problem. Yeah, if it helps, um, I, I everything I learned at Chafee is what led to this video. Um, of course, life led me to the song, maybe, but Chafee was part of that. I uh, I even got my name because I before Chafee I got injured my jaw, and then I really considered things in life, and then I was led back to Chafee, and um, I've been training in film, theater, and music since, and uh, yeah, the. The guys that made the video are students as well. Here we go.
Thank you so much for watching and giving me this opportunity. I don't know if I was supposed, if I'm supposed to say anything else, but thank you and everyone's doing great. Thank you so much. That look is a look that can thank only you. a roaring fire at a verbal cabin while the kids are here. Your together awaits. Hold on. Find it with verbal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to end the YouTube. Okay. Um, <clears throat> great job, Chris. Um, okay, so artistic abstraction that leads to deeper meaning can be a difficult task. It takes deep thought, time, and a lot of creativity. This next presenter has created a piece worthy of celebration because of its ability to capture our imaginations in terms of meaning and thinking outside of strict categories. Ironically, it uses a box to help us think outside of it. Um, please welcome Tori Watson to present her artwork. Thank you. Um... Hello, so my art piece is a representation of Riley's overall mentality. Uh, the television represents Riley's anxiety about everyone always watching and judging them. There are shadows surrounding Riley to depict a cloak-like shading and representation of Riley's sometimes dark and uncertain mentality when trying to figure out their true self. The Riley in my painting has a combination of both stereotypical female and male features with colored shadings from the gender fluid flag. There is a compass placed in the location of the heart, which Riley has stated in the book, is to represent whether their internal compass points more to female, male, or in between on a daily basis. Thank you for viewing my artwork. Uh, so uh, I still remember where I was when I received the phone call telling me my mom had passed away. Uh, even before I answered, I knew from the caller ID and the time of day that the news would most likely be devastating. And it was. In her essay, That Beautiful Tree, our next award-winning author, the courageous and talented Sarah Smelzer, tells the story of her mom's passing. Early on in that essay, Sarah writes, there was a time in my life when I held my breath for seven days straight. The last of those days ended with the knowledge that sadly I was facing a new world. Sarah was the most outstanding student in my fall 2020 composition class and she is one of the all-time best students I have ever known. Her brilliant and emotional writing describes in detail the axis tilting experience of losing a parent and the first few moments of life in that new world. Told with honesty and nuance, 
Her story is both heartrending and inspirational. Please welcome Sarah Smelzer. Thanks, I already want to cry. <laughs> uh, that beautiful tree. Uh, okay, let me just. There is a passage written in the book, Symptoms of Being Human, that I understand all too well. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, I've been holding my breath for as long as I can remember, and now I can finally breathe. For Riley Cavanaugh, the sense of relief came from finally feeling acceptance. For me, the relief I felt was bittersweet, but relief all the same. I rarely speak of it, and I try my best to not even think about it, but there was a time in my life when I held my breath for seven days straight. The last of those days ended with the knowledge that sadly, I am facing a new world, a world without my mom in it. Her final week of battling breast cancer was spent in the home that I shared with my husband and son so that I could be alongside of her until the end. The events that occurred the day of my mom's passing led me to a pivotal moment in my grief that changed the way that I viewed her death and helped me to find relief in knowing that she was no longer in pain and in a better place. With the support of my family, I endured long hours of watchful waiting, faced the inevitable passing of my mom, and came to the realization that the last conversation I had with her was a gift I will always treasure. Dad, the nurse is here. I knock lightly on the door and peek into the makeshift hospital room that is set up in the front bedroom of my house. She is here to check mom's vitals, I say, as I enter the room, my voice disturbing the silence. Startled, my mom takes a breath and then settles back in, eyes still closed. This is the seventh morning since we moved her into my house for her end of life treatment. Hospice, what you do when there is no longer hope. For my mom, this meant no food, no water, just a morphing induced, slow, steady decline to the end. It is painful to watch, to see her like this, thin as bone and the color of ash. This is nothing like the mom that I know. She's always been lively and a happy person, quirky and creative. She fought hard up to this point, but being the courageous woman she is, my mom had a piece about her as she began this end of life journey. As for me, I just want my best friend back. I give the room a quick once over, picking up some of the bereavement cards that have fallen to the floor. The room scattered with dozens of aging flower arrangements that have been delivered to my house. Each of them beginning to wilt emitting the icky smell of floral decay. I glance down at a card in my hand. The silver scrolling words on the front of the card claim to be those of Walt Whitman stating, nothing can happen more beautiful than death. Forgive me, Walt, but I sincerely disagree with you. My dad slowly stands up from his chair next to the hospital bed, greeting the nurse politely as she comes in. He's been up all night by my mom's side so that I could rest. Last week, when I realized how emotionally and physically draining hospice care is, I called for my dad's help. Though my parents have been divorced for the last 16 years, he did not hesitate in packing his bags to come stay with us. I 
I'm so thankful he is here. The nurses, the nurse moves quickly around the hospital bed, making notes and measurements. I stand in the room, clutching the card and staring blankly. Moments pass and a noise from the kitchen reminds me that I'm in the middle of preparing breakfast before the nurse's arrival. My mind gets distracted so easily these days. I excuse myself leaving the room, Walt's card and my mom behind. In the kitchen, I get back to the task of feeding my toddler son. He's the only thing that's getting me through the last seven days, besides the bottle of vodka in the freezer and the never ending and cleaning up after the grieving mourners who come to see my mom one last time. She's not woken up for the last five days, so it's been a dreary welcome to say the least. I'm leaving my dad and me and my husband to do all the entertaining. Believe me, I needed that vodka. My dad enters the kitchen looking 10 years older. I gaze at him and I just know. He nods and mutters the words, she's gone. I close my eyes and slowly let out a breath, steady my reaction. My son, sensing something is wrong, begins climbing me like a mountain to get into my arms. I gather him up and fight to get air past the closure in my throat. I knew it was coming and I knew it would be painful. I'm just not sure how to handle the suffocating waves of emotion. But I just saw her take a breath, I say in denial. My dad shrugged, shrugs grimly. I need a minute. I mumbled, placing my now crying son in front of his breakfast. I flee to my room, straight into my walk-in closet and shut the door behind me. I sink to the floor, my face in my hands, anticipating the emotion of the last six months to come pouring out of me, but it doesn't. I feel stunted and torn. I deserve to cry. I deserve to feel the pain, to wallow in my own misery over losing my mom, my best friend. In frustration, I try to rein in my thoughts and allow myself to reflect on what I'm truly feeling. I focus on the last conversation that I had with my mom. She had not eaten in days at that point. It was heavily sedated. She was having a lucid moment. There was so, there were seldom few after moving her here. Sarah, she told me smiling. Jesus is waiting for me. He's wearing a white t-shirt and jeans, no shoes. He is waiting for me there under a beautiful tree and it has a bowl full of fruit. That fruit is gonna taste so good. I cried when she told me then and the tears began to flow now. I know that she's made it there to that tree. As sad as I am in this moment, I feel something else. Relief. <laughs> Relief for my mom, who is no longer in pain. She is now barefoot and cancer-free, eating all the fruit that she wants. How can I deny the happiness in that? My mom taught me that there will always be light in the darkness. And the gift of that last conversation with her was just the amount of light that I needed to face the world without her. Smiling through my tears, I think again about that Walt Whitman quote. I understand it now in a different way. <laughs> Nothing can happen more beautiful than death for the person whose soul gets to meet a t-shirt and jeans wearing Jesus under that beautiful tree. Forgive me, Walt, I do sincerely agree with you after all. It's been eight years since my mom's passing. And I don't believe that I've cried as much in all of those years as I have while reliving and writing about those last moments with her, like Riley experienced in Symptoms of Being Human, writing about my feelings and sharing my story with others has been cathartic and more freeing than I imagined. 
everyone deals with loss differently. And I realized that trying not to think about those final days has done nothing to help my grief. You know, no human life is free of loss and suffering and dealing with it can be difficult. And I hope that anyone who hears my story will remember it during their time of loss and find comfort that their loved one will be happily waiting for them under that beautiful tree. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so it's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our last, but uh, certainly not least, reader for the evening, uh, Timi Lolua Ogane. Um, her essay shows us how per how pervasive, sorry, uh, our society's fixation on binary systems is. We want things to be either either or, not something else. Um, in her essay, she discusses what it's like to come from a background that her new society has a hard time categorizing and safely labeling. And, and like uh, Jeff Garvin in Symptoms of Being Human, uh, Timmy Lolua does a great job of using metaphors to show the reader what it's like to be excluded from this neat either or system to, to help bridge, build bridges of understanding so we can all um, understand where she's coming from. And finally, our next reader also shows the reader our next reader also shows the reader what it means to escape from the unhealthy demands of this system, to find a way to belong to yourself. So take it away, Timmy Lolua. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm going to read my uh, essay. Um, I'm a wallflower, misfit, someone out of the ordinary. Time and time again, I dreaded high school attendance. It always went like this. Mark, here. Megan, here. Maddie, here. Tamiwa. I hated that my name caused such a wide disparity and interrupted the normal, the flow of normal white names. But I'm a wallflower, so I could do nothing but listen, either to understand my place or find where I belong. Instead of choosing one or the other, I ran away from who I genuinely was because I could not escape the box. I was trapped. The box hovered over my line of vision and prevented me from knowing where I belonged. So I kept running, shifting between my culture and not embodying the stereotypical black girl. I, ne I neither got the references nor slang and made one black or white. I poked two holes in the box, eager to see the world around me and who I could be one day. As I held my gaze, I observed my surroundings mirrored what worked and discarded what didn't. I took and took until I realized I couldn't do anything else but take. I was like clay, easily groomed as I absorbed more than I could withstand. Thus, I soaked up the perfect American accent, how, to perf how the perfect Instagram body should look, what clothes I should wear or which hairstyles would bring more attention to me. I felt it was wrong to be me. People would come up to me and say, wow, I love your accent. I would never and would never talk to me again. Immediately, I thought to myself, dang it, I failed. Why was I so different? With each step, it was the clink of my heels that sent out signals, welcoming my presence before I even uttered a word. I was like an empty can, and my culture was the sound that followed. People heard the sound before they saw me. And like others, I was ashamed of this, that sound because it was loud. I envied those without the clink. It was a little remarks like, did you live in the jungle or did you see lions every day? That made me feel like I needed to mask my sound. I needed to cover every inclination of my African culture to be noticed by my peers and to prove, my, prove to myself that I was worth of, every, of any reverence. Layer after layer, my sound drowned under the padding. Hence, I shortened my name and put on my best American voice. But like the buzzing of a bee and the chirping of a bird, my sound still reminded me of its existence. As I walked, I was unsure of when my armor would rip and the sound would, re would reveal itself once more. Swiftly, I created a person who took on the souls of those around me and molded the personalities I observed as my own. I created a person that was one way at home, one way at school, and one way online. Consequently, I surrounded myself with sh shallow friendships, joined organizations where I felt excluded, 
and overanalyzed how my actions would come across to strangers who didn't even know how to pronounce my name. I wasn't too surprised. After all, I created a distorted version of myself. It only made sense that I attracted people who liked a false version of myself. I felt like a stray dog, cheerful and potent in one sense, but also one that is two-faced and lacks direction. During the day, I am my happiest, barking loudly and making strangers with glee, but at night, I cower in fear, missing the warmth of a real home. Like the stray dog, I longed for the sharp rays of the sun to chase the stillness of the night and my dark thoughts away. Unlike the other days when my pain was postponed by the swiftness of the alarm, tonight was different. This time, my thoughts pursued me with intent through the night. As I rolled over and counted down the hours until it was time to put on a merry face again, my mind spiraled into a frenzy of obscure emotions. It was impossible to dream. Why does my mind scream? I continually sink into the mattress without care. My hair is now a mess from tossing and turning. I sit up for air. My clothes long melted into skin, drenched in a pool of my fears. All I can do is think. Where do I begin? Think. Maybe tomorrow I will feel this pain. Or am I just insane? No, I just need to obtain steam. In the meantime, the headaches intensifi intensified and made me wince as I consumed more and more water. The aching feelings in my stomach now met a thighs towards my back, shoulders, and legs. Now laying on my stomach, something whispered to me repeatedly. Who are you? And louder. Who are you? I was so consumed by perfect American names and the unrealistic bodies around me. Keeping one out of three meals a day and repressing that culture turned into having only one meal a day and hating the sound of my own name. As my mind finally faded to black, as my mind faded to black, finally releasing me, I could only hear the faint sounds of my mom's singing. Temi Lulua, Temi Lulua, my precious child, a gem that is precious as just a piece of the universe. I was brought up by the principles of this old Nigerian song my mom would sing to me before bedtime. I never understood what she was talking about, but my younger self liked the way my name sounded in the song. So I would always beg her to keep singing, even when my bedtime had long disintegrated from the forefront of my mind. As time passed, it became utterly clear the difference in how my name sounded from those I loved, which is how I viewed myself, and those I tried to belittle me. It was extremely difficult for me to come to terms with the fact that I would never be like the manufactured bodies of the line. I would never sound like them or dress like them. As a result, I was not okay. Hating my name and starving myself was not going to raise my esteem in the depths of my overly critical gaze. It was the stereotype nature of the American dream that blinded me from realizing that one country or that one concept of beauty does not hold all the treasures to life. My mother saw the errant pride in my existence and remembered, and remembering her song became the catalyst. Beneath all the lining, I was still a shy Nigerian girl who wanted to be accepted. I may not fit into the ample categories of life, but I am my own subset. I am Temi Lulu, Temi for short, which means mine in English. Truly, I belong to myself and no one else. Thank you guys. Thank you, Temi Lulua. And thank you to all uh, who have attended tonight. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to my colleagues who have introduced those presenters. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I thought I was on mute there for a second. Um, and th thank you to all who have supported uh, the One Book, One College program over the years. Um, to the award winners, <clears throat> uh, please participate in next year's contest. Uh, we would love to see you back. Uh, the next uh, ne next year's college book is Come On In, 15 Stories About Immigration and Finding Home. Um, so I would uh, encourage you to please um, uh, submit your essays and artwork again uh, for, that, uh, for that book. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming and participating in this, uh, in this event. Uh, and I hope you all have a great night. Thank you again.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Excellent job. Hi, everyone. Well done, everyone, congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. Congrats. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you so Bye. much. Danny. Oh. <laughs>